Now, today we're going to discuss about the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on international political economy and on the stability of the post-war liberal international order and its progeny, which is the neoliberalism, uh, in the coming few years. My guest today is Indrajit Parmar. He's a professor of international politics at the City University of London, and currently is also uh, a visiting fellow at LSE Ideas. Hello, Indrajit. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, and really uh, good to talk with you again. Nath. So let me begin by asking you, you know, how's it in London, especially with your prime minister being in the grip of coronavirus? Is London really learning the hard way that the best antidote against this borderless and classless coronavirus is actually a proper lockdown? Yeah, I think they were very, very slow to react. And, and to some extent, um, the prime minister was the slowest of all. And uh, he was went on television to say that everything was fine. This wasn't very serious. But he'd been going around shaking hands deliberately with coronavirus patients in hospitals. And then a couple of weeks later, he's diagnosed with some mild symptoms. Um, and they are mild, I think. And he seems to be have recovered or is recovering, as is the same with uh, with Prince Charles. But I think more than that kind of blasé attitude towards his own personal health, I think there was a kind of deeper political reasoning behind it too, because the government, this conservative government, has carried out several exercises over the last few years uh, to do with how a global pandemic would affect the National Health Service and whether the National Health Service, for example, could really handle something like that on, on that scale. And each of the exercises, the last one was in 2016, showed that uh, no the, the nhs was not in a position to be to be able to handle such a crisis but they buried the reports each time and because they would have had to spend a very large amount of money on the national health and other public services and so on to to kind of restore it to some sort of a decent level so i think there was a kind of slow response because it went against the austerity agenda which they had championed as the only alternative for the last decade or so. So I think the US also reacted very slowly. And we know how President Trump has been uh, flip-flopping and uh, misleading uh, and providing wrong information and being corrected by his own advisors and, and particularly his, uh, the people on the, uh, on the health front. So I think they both, neither of them want really to recognize that there is such a thing as the state and that the state does have more functions than just care, taking care of a kind of marketplace or for corporate deregulation or for empowering corporations, that actually to have a, a resi truly resilient society and economy, you actually need a large infrastructure, which usually can only be largely supplied by a strategy by the state because the amount of resources that are required for it. And I think they're both learning and have learned very much the hard way. And I think the societies are paying the price um, for that. And it's not an entirely classless, because I think if you're poor and you're a working class person, they have received very little compensation. Um, they have been treated much worse. Many of them are still having to go to work. In the US car factories, for example, many are having to go on wildcat strikes. The postal workers are still working on the whole uh, in most countries. So there's a lot of working class people who are not heavily unionized as they used to be and have fewer protections. And it's hard for those occupations to be for, pe for people to work from home. You know, in a middle class kind of administrative managerial uh, teaching and so on, you can work from home a lot more easily. But if you're building a house or a flat or a shop, or you're delivering letters and so on, then you have to be out there. And that means interacting with everybody. The chances of you being uh, infected are very high and then spreading the infection. There's no protection being offered for them. Masks are not available. Uh, hand sanitizers and so on are not available. 
And consequence of that is that that so it's felt differently, experienced differently by different classes of people as well. Although, of course, we know the royalty and right in number 10 Downing Street and, and in, in and near the White House and in the Congress and so on, people have caught it. But the chances of, of working class people catching it in certain professions have been much higher. So learning a lesson slowly is very, very costly in a number of different ways. And uh, I think that is a source of great anger that, in effect, the people have had to lead the governments by not showing up to work, by going on strike and uh, making complaints. And that's actually what has forced the government in this country. Teachers stopped showing up to school because they had caring facilities, uh, caring responsibilities for elderly relatives and people with conditions. Children start to stop, parents stopped delivering their children to school because they themselves are looking after vulnerable people at home and therefore the child could bring something back. The people led and the government followed very slowly. No, that's yeah. because now, uh, that's one important thing that we are seeing that the, mm. the true class character of the capitalist states is now very, very starkly visible now in the entire, like yeah. saw, I was reading it, uh, a, a report in The Guardian which states that there are a lot of, uh, uh, the homeless in the Americans are being, you know, put in the parking lot. And, right. And uh, despite there being so many hotels around, despite there being so many schools which are empty, similar things are happening in India. You know, people, right. have left, the, the working migrant workers have been left to, you know, oh. fend for themselves. Uh, they are on yeah. the highway walking about 400 odd kilometers. So, so yeah. the class character is becoming more and more visible. Correct. On to our next question, what we are seeing is that this virus has actually, you know, sort of rocked and rattled the global financial markets. Mm. And the stock prices are plunged and the bond yields have equally plunged. Uh, yeah. This health crisis is fast becoming an economic uh, nightmare and uh -huh. which in turn will expose us to sort of unprecedented financial crisis in the coming years or in the coming, uh, you know, mm. months. In such a gloomy scenario, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Well, I think we always have to have hope, but we have to be realistic also. And I think, as you outlined, the, this is a financial, well, the, the global health epidemic has exacerbated to a kind of degree probably previously unseen the, the coming market crises. And we know that the stock markets have been soaring for quite some time because of the tax cuts in the United States and the increased levels of uh, dividends and so on, uh, and the buyback, stock buybacks, uh, and the just the increased level of gambling and the cheap money which made that all possible. So if you like, if, publications like the Financial Times and The Economist and many others as well were predicting that at some point uh, the kind of roller coaster character of the financial markets was going to come to another grinding crash along the lines of maybe as bad or worse than 2008. And so if you like, there was that kind of fear of that already. So there is an underlying structural problem. And what the global pandemic, the COVID-19 has done, has added a kind of new dimension. And it's actually closed down large amounts of economic activity. And that has had an effect uh, of worsening that particular crisis. So I think we have that. And I think what it truly shows uh, to objective observers is that that entire system is, is deeply flawed and it kind of lurches from one deep crisis to another. That, that kind of focus around, ideologically around uh, the people armed with money taking the decisions will actually lead to everybody having economic growth and prosperity and stability and peace and so on. But that model actually does not really work. It doesn't deliver and it's increasingly failing to deliver. And we can see the effects, as you said. You have empty host hotels, empty schools, but you have large numbers of homeless people who are out in parking lots and so on. And that entire kind of system, if you like, has been shown, there's a light being shone on it and it's been shown to be deeply wanting. And the light at the end of the tunnel, I guess, is at the same time, when we look at who is now keeping people alive, who are the workers who are keeping the society to some extent together? Who's delivering the medicine 
from pharmacy to homes, who's delivering the medicines, who's, who's working in the hospitals, keeping them clean, who are the people who are delivering uh, all the food and other necessities, who are marginalized workers who have been treated very badly through cuts in, uh, in the state spending on healthcare, for example, but also cuts in regard to uh, changes in uh, technology, which have created this huge gig economy, which has created a very precarious workforce. So I think what you've got is you've got several million workers who previously were on the receiving end of all the bad elements of technology, automation, and cuts in state spending suddenly are seen as publicly seen as heroes. And they're seeing that actually there is a great value in the kind of work that they're doing, and this is accentuated. And, and it seems to me that that is actually a very, very important development. That development, I think, with a public sympathy for those people as well and the support for them, allied with what were existing um, uh, protests from the Green New Deal, uh, Extinction Rebellion, the people who wanted to deal with climate change in a more radical way and wanted to, if you like, uh, reform the corporate economy away from smokestack industries towards clean technologies and that kind of thing. I think that the two allied together, I suspect, are probably provide us with a degree of hope that you've got a kind of movement from below which says you've got to recognize people who have been living in precarious positions. There is the building blocks for a kind of movement for change, some of which are already there, some of which have become apparent because of this particular crisis. And I think if a leadership uh, could be formed around those, and I think the other final thing I would add is there, is that even that Davos, the World Economic Forum, and the reports that they see, Look at hedge fund managers and other reports who talk about the kind of uh, coming uh, sort of breakdown of the international system, breakdown of the society, the growing levels of inequality, political polarization, and the kind of capacity for breakdown in societies. Um, I think there are those elements there too. And I think it's a question of can something develop, leadership develop, which can fuse bring together and kind of uh, make a reform movement out of that. I think that is our hope uh, that ordinary people are now kind of seeing. We're all watching the news every day to see uh, how it's all panning out. And I think, I think that is the light at the end of the tunnel that I would, I would look to see. Yeah, that, that, yeah certainly, that certainly offers us a lot of hope because I was reading another uh, story somewhere in the newspapers about how the uh, uh, how the nurses from Kerala are working in uh, you know United Kingdom and you know doing a yeoman service oh. at this moment. So, but the next question flows from there, and so will this kind of a globalized virus sort of promote more anti-globalism? Will it lead to more protectionism, not just in trade, but also oh. severely impact the movement of labor across continents? And yeah. uh, because this idea of social distancing can hmm. get converted. We're seeing this happening uh, to social ostracization sort of a thing. Sure. Uh, you know, and it definitely is going to make international travel almost hmm. So what do you think? Yeah, well, I think there's so many different tendencies which are already existing. So there was a rise of nationalism and a kind of parochialism um, in many parts of the world already. Um, at the same time, there are those who are opposing it. Um, and I think what we could see from even among the populist nationalists of the right, and even on the, if you like, the left who are opposed to various kinds of free trade agreements, which were diminishing the rights of labor and labor protections, for example, what you could see even with those groups was that most of them were not arguing for an isolationism and a kind of complete detachment from the world, because the real reality of it is, is that the other thing which the COVID-19 pandemic has shown is, is that our food, our other supplies, our raw materials, our masks for protection, medical equipment, and many, many other things, they're actually our global supply chains. You can't sort of say, well, we're going to be ultra-nationalists unless you want to basically have no supply of large amounts, or you're going to be able to re-gear your economy uh, or your agriculture 
which is unlikely to happen because this is the result of two centuries of economic strategy, which was open to agricultural products from other places and sending out your products, yeah, industrial and other, to the rest of the world. So, so I think there's going to be, there's going, it's going to be very interesting because even the most arch nationalists like America First Trumpists had to recognize the United States is deeply embedded in global supply chains. And even those who started to move a little bit out of China into Southeast Asia, a global pandemic uh, doesn't care about nationalism. Yes. It is truly without nation. It is truly global. It says we're, it's coming. Um, and so I think it's going to have to be probably a little bit of each, a recognition that nations and nation states have got to have infrastructure at home, that you cannot be entirely kind of a, if you like, you know, play just one role in the international globe, in the global economy, that you've got to have some level of uh, resilience through diversification of your economy, such that you can weather storms of this kind. That means a state, state intervention to maintain, at the same time as recognizing that you are dependent on other parts of the world for much of what you do, and that your businesses and your economies, your educational systems, and so on, are global. But at the same time, and therefore, you need to keep that open. But the management of the global, what the state does at the national level, the interstate system, the intergovernmental systems, have got to step up to deal with at that level, and then mobilize the various private sources, forces as well. So you've got to recognize that, if you like, there's a sensible level of nationalism and nation state activity within a system. So something which recognizes that you do, we live in the local, but we are affected by the global. Will this, will this kind of what we are seeing now, the kind of movement we're seeing in the economy, will it lead to greater de-dollarization of the world economy, as one mm. would say? And especially one, when one sees that the oil uh, you know, prices mm. in a nosedive in this so yeah, scenario. it was happening before itself, but this is yeah. actually accelerating <clears throat> the entire process. Mm. So, is it possible that the dollar lost, loses its sheen fast and as a reserve currency of the world, and you know, you, we we move faster towards a multilateral <laughs> order? Or That's a tough one. Like order itself? Yeah, uh, it's it's a difficult one. I mean, from what I read, and I'm not an economist. Um, what I've read is a large number of a uh, large amount of money is actually going into dollars than out of dollars at this crisis point. So the dollar as a reserve currency, which is backed by the federal government, remains a store of value, more highly prized than any other currency. And I don't think the Chinese currency or the euro or the euro uh, is anywhere near. Uh, the levels at which people are keeping their money in dollars. So you look at the dollar against the pound, I think we're back to what it was in 1985 during the height of the miners' strike when it was almost one-to-one. -one. So I think the dollar remains a very powerful currency, but the longer-term trend is for a multipolar, multipolarity and a kind of distribution of economic power far wider than it used to be. And I suspect that is going to carry on. But I don't think we should underestimate the power of the United States, just, not just the dollar, but the entire international payment system. That is the kind of the infrastructure behind the operations of the system itself. So the ability to weaponize the dollar is something that has been sharpened up quite a lot in the last three years or so. And Donald Trump has is one thing he knows. He knows how powerful the levers that he can pull so that when you want to starve Iran uh, and to sort of ex to apply sanctions on it, uh, you can apply the uh, kind of the, the US sanctions very, very strongly. So I wouldn't write off the dollar just yet, but certainly the US has lost leadership politically. More countries are looking to others and themselves much more. And I think that then opens the way for other chains of relationships, other reliances, because the US has effectively signaled for quite a few years now that they wanted to pass more of the burden of global leadership onto others, uh, in any case, militarily, as well as 
uh, financially and so on, and institutionally. And I think that tendency is probably going to be strengthened. But I think the power of the US is probably likely to be greater than any other single state or combination for quite some time. So do you think that the US is going to really you know that the chinks in their entire health system have been exposed? Uh, are they going to spend a little more on the health sector? Are they going to you know reduce their spending in defense by any stretch of imagination? And so you and and what is going to be their attitude towards China? You know, immediately uh, now when during the ongoing ongoing crisis, when Trump used mm. the word the Chinese virus and then backtracked, and now he's seeking yeah. Chinese help. So, in this respect, do you think is there going to be any shift in the U.S.-China relations? Uh, you know, especially uh, after this. Yeah, it could be actually. I think it'll probably exacerbate certain tendencies which are already in motion. I think in the, the kind of long term, longer term goal of the United States is really the subordination of the Chinese ambition uh, regionally and globally and the Chinese model. And I think in that regard, the EU is probably on very kind of closely allied, even if their way they want to do it is different with the US. US has declared China a strategic rival. The EU has declared it a systemic rival. Both are quite similar. Both want China to kind of diminish the level of its role of its state in, the, in its technological sectors and so on, which they believe are leading to their you know, kind of superiority. So I think there is that. So whatever weapon they can use, in order to promote that agenda, especially the US, they'll do that. So some of them are talking about the Wuhan virus, the Chinese virus. Some of them are talking about um, uh, making China pay for this. The debate about Huawei in Britain and in other countries is kind of being reopened. So this could lead to uh, a certain amount of movement on that kind of a front. But in the longer run as well, the interdependence the role of China in the global economy is very, very powerful and probably going to increase. So the interdependence of economies of the US and China, of Southeast Asia, uh, of, of the whole world, of Europe, on the Chinese and other economies in the East is going to continue. And I think they don't want that to, to, uh, to diminish, really. What they would like is a kind of subordination of China and Chinese ambition because they, they fear China as a global power. Uh, and that global power is going to then challenge their positions economically, financially, institutionally, and maybe at some point uh, militarily as well. So I don't think that goal has changed. This COVID-19, I think some forces will seek to use it as a weapon to in that particular ongoing, ongoing struggle. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was wonderful speaking to you. And I'm sure in the coming days and months, we're going to have more conversations on these issues because this is not going to go away so soon. Thank you so much once again.